If you find that you like tank chats, why not subscribe to the Tank Museum channel and you can watch them all. Thanks very much. Now this is the universal carrier. A lot of you will call it the Bren gun carrier. Now strictly speaking that's incorrect. There was a thing called a Bren gun carrier. It appeared a bit earlier along with two other vehicles, the scout carrier and the cavalry carrier and they preceded the universal. It came about thus. These vehicles, the Bren carrier, scout carrier and so on were pre-war really and in 1940 they decided to amalgamate all their functions into just one vehicle which could do everything and that's how the Universal Carrier was born. Now these were built in Britain in huge numbers and also in Canada which is another country that turned out a huge number of them. They were used everywhere. In fact there were so many versions of it that it would take me all day to list them even if I could remember them all which I can't but it was a, an incredibly useful little vehicle. Very sophisticated in a way, a tracked vehicle as you can see, with quite an unusual um, drive system in it. The odd thing is that the back, which is where the load is carried, is really divided into three parts, and the centre part is taken up by a Ford V8 engine, which rather spoils the um, accommodation area there, except that without an engine, of course, the thing's absolutely useless. But that's how it worked. It had a Ford V8 engine driving through a four-speed gearbox into a conventional truck-type back axle, just like an ordinary lorry, really, and was a, a, quite a delightful thing to drive. I've driven one myself, and they really are good fun. But you, you, it's a, a shorter person's vehicle, really. A bit difficult if you're rather tall. Your knees tend to get in the way but they are quite an interesting little vehicle. They weigh about four to five tonnes, usually about four tonnes. Armour thickness is anything up to 10 millimetres, which isn't very much at all, really. And of course, it has no head cover whatsoever. All the crew are very exposed from down firing shots, which could cause a lot of trouble at certain times. The driver sits here at the front on the right, Next to him is the vehicle commander who also has charge of whatever weapon he chooses to fire out of the, the slots here. Um, it can take a Bren gun, which was the normal weapon, but normally the, the gun had just held the gun. It didn't have any mounting of its own. You just pointed the gun to the hole and fired it. You could let the top down and make another slit there and use the boy's anti-tank rifle, though that was getting a bit long in the tooth by the time the war came. So these little vehicles were used all over the place. We gave a lot to the Russians, God knows what they made of them, but um, they, they had quite a lot of them. And they were used by almost everybody, even the Americans used them once during the Pacific campaign. Didn't like them, but they used them. Um, and it is quite a, a, a novel little vehicle. They've always been one that I've rather fancied. I've, I've rather sort of identified myself with the history of these vehicles, but they aren't ideal. There's, there's no two ways about it. No other country built anything quite like them. They're quite weird, but they were used in vast numbers all over the place and lasted well after the war. Some going to serve in Korea and so on with just the same sort of result but um, incredibly popular little vehicles. Normally it would carry a crew of three or four, two men in the front, as I've already said, the others in the back. There were seats for them, but they were horribly uncomfortable. You just made up space wherever you could and got into that. But that's how it worked. They were used for carrying things, for, for doing reconnaissance and that kind of thing. And quite often with guns sticking out nearly everywhere, but mainly, they were just a made-of-all-work type of vehicle. Spare wheels at the front here. Behind the driver, you've got the radiator, then the engine, as I said, right down the middle of the fighting compartment, and then um, the axle at the back. At the rear is a towing hook, usually, for pulling a, an anti-tank gun. You weren't supposed to pull anti-tank guns, but they did. And you weren't supposed to pull trailers, but they did. They put all sorts of ideas forward for this little thing. This particular one is rather odd, actually. If you look at the sides, you'll see it's got stub axles sticking out 
There are two on that side and two on this side. Now those stub axles really advertise what this vehicle is used for. Ignore the markings, they're to do with the 43rd Wessex Division, but this vehicle itself never served with any division that we know of. It was used up at Chertsey. And what they did was fitted a pair of um, railway wheels to it, to extension arms, which pivoted on those things, those axles sticking out the sides, and were held in place by springs at the front. It was exactly the same at the back. You had the railway wheels on two swinging arms sticking out the back. And the idea was that you rested the vehicle on the edges of a pit and it ran along rails and you used the jacks or the, the springs here to adjust the height of it or the pressure that it would put on the ground and you could put any surface you liked in the pit underneath from mud to solid sand or whatever and it was just to test the vehicle with different weights as a resistance and how well it functioned on these different um, surfaces. You could do the same thing by driving it through mud if you wanted to, but um, they preferred the work, the sort of um, clinical approach inside the workshops, and that's how it was done. But that's the layout of the vehicle. Now, what I wanted to do in particular was show you the suspension, but while we're over here, we might as well look at these little things. They're actually part of the deep wading apparatus that fits around the vehicle, and if you can see it, there's a, a mounting for a two-inch mortar just to the left of the gunner there, but they were just incidental things. What I really wanted to talk about is the suspension. Now this has got what is known as, it's a horseman system basically, but it was known as the Vickers slow motion suspension. It involves a pair of springs working and the bogey works by um, one wheel moving against the other, if you can see that. And that is all then worked by a return roller at the top, and it's all supplied as one cluster. But the interesting thing, and this is absolutely unique to the Universal Carrier, is that this bogey and the one on the other side share a common tube that runs across the vehicle underneath. And this tube can be displaced by turning the steering wheel. So by turning the steering wheel, the tube moves out this way or moves in, and the bogey goes with it. That curves the track. Now, as you do that, the vehicle steers. It was designed originally to make, to compensate it, if you like, for the camber on the highway. So as the vehicle appeared to slide into the gutter, you use this to stabilize it a little bit and keep it on the straight and narrow. But later on, they found it was a remarkable method of steering the vehicle. It'll only do this on ordinary roads on ordinary corners, on tight corners, you have to skid steer the same as you would with any other track vehicle and that's a different matter altogether. But this idea of using the cross tube that moved across the vehicle was almost completely unique to this little vehicle. It meant that the, the, the driver could drive using a wheel like in a car and move this a little bit out or, or in and curve it around corners as he came to them. The track would give enough to allow that and that's really how it worked. When these things were used as reconnaissance vehicles for the, um, uh, the armoured corps in, in the main, um, they were, the idea was that they had to precede the tanks and in the desert they used to bottom very hard because they were always going rather too fast to keep ahead of the tanks and in doing so they usually flattened the exhaust silencers, absolutely smashed them into the ground. Now they worked all right when you can get, you can get around by just um, having a break in the pipe which works the same way. Exhaust, it makes a bit, the vehicle a bit noisier but uh, the exhaust still works. But that used to happen then and they, had, they kept trying to think of ways to overcome this. It's, all, it's very difficult. The vehicle is well sprung and it's liable on a moving fast on bumpy ground to hit the ground very hard. And although the rest of the vehicle is solid underneath and could deal with that, those exhaust pipes are very vulnerable and got flattened. And that was a problem they had with these vehicles quite a lot in the desert, usually dr through driving too fast. But they were one of the most useful vehicles ever produced. There were self-propelled gun versions and all kinds of odd variations of this vehicle. But... Um, I say if I listen to them all we'd be here all day and thanks very much. 
If you like the videos here at the Tank Museum, then please subscribe on YouTube and support the Tank Museum on Patreon.